The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. This is Brian from Breaking Down Security. This week is part two with our discussion with Dr. Catherine J. Ullman on incident response uh, communications. We're gonna go into some in-depth about talking about your audience, uh, how you would tailor your uh, reports or status in this case, uh, you know, depending on who you're talking to and the depth that you would go into on, on you know, things like how did this happen or, um, how, you know, who, who was involved. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, where and when you should be placing blame, but also uh, being able to explain what happened in such a way as to not uh, alienate potential people who might have caused the issue. Uh, we also talk about uh, how each level of the organization should be looking at uh, the, the what, when, why, and how. Uh, and you know the the process involved and how you got there and and ways that you might improve in the in the in the future. Um, I also asked a question about you know incidents in, in terms of uh, severity. So you know does a does a specific level of incident mean that uh, your communication would scale accordingly? Would you involve the entire company in a you know an email breach or would you? Uh, you know, only mention certain groups or, you know, what, what's involved there. And finally, we talk about uh, the B-sides uh, that she is involved with, B-sides Rochester, which has already occurred. Hope you've had a good time if you went to that. Uh, if you missed it, make sure you mark it on your calendar. We'll talk about uh, when that is next year um, later on in the show. Hope you have a great week and we'll go ahead and get started with our, our next question. When you're obviously we're we're talking about communication and methods of communication. When you're working with senior people as well, um, I think my question here it says it's important to share necessary information with senior people and higher ups. But is there such a thing as oversharing? How do you toe the line between oversharing or nothing at all? Um, you know, obviously you don't want to keep your senior people in in the dark, but you know, they don't need to know like uber technical stuff, right? Or does it really right. just depend on the organization? Well, I think to a certain degree, it depends on the org. But on the whole, your your executive level folks, um, they don't know and they don't care. Uh, what I always say is, you know, imagine 30 seconds in an elevator, right? You've got 30 seconds to get your message out. Now, it's all about knowing your audience and, and framing that discussion. So you really you shouldn't be talking to those folks for the very first time when you have an incident. Ideally, you know who they are, um, not just by name and by face, but you know something about them. You know what, you know, what they find uncomfortable. Um, do, you know, are they the sort of person that 30 seconds is it, that's all you're gonna get? Or are they the kind of person that they really wanna sit down because they wanna understand the minutia? And there are some execs that, that wanna know more. They, they still may not wanna know things about IP addresses, but they may wanna understand um, in a broader sense what happened. Whereas other executives are gonna say, you know, how does this impact the organization at, at, the, at, at the holistic level, right? How does this impact our reputation? How does this impact our product? How does this impact our bottom line? And, and it, for those folks, boy, keeping it short and sweet is really important. So I think part of it is knowing your audience, right? It's knowing whether that executive wants more or less. Um, but I agree that um, most executives, I don't think are going to want, you know, the gory details. They're going to want to understand how, how the bigger picture is going to be impacted. Well, one gory detail that they pretty much always want to know is how did this happen? Right. And yes, but, hard. but I don't think they want to know that Joe Schmo clicked a button like that. That's not necessarily the level of detail they want though. Do you, do you agree, Brian? Um, well, I don't think they know what they want to know when it comes to how did this happen? Like if, you know, Joe clicked a button, I don't think that's a, that's a very good explanation of how that happened. Maybe it was, well, um, 
we didn't have this control in place and that allowed Joe, right. To be able to click that button and get us compromised, or it was a zero day. We had no, no idea this was coming. Right. And no one did. Right. right. It's affecting everybody, you know, things like that. Um, it's hard. It, it's hard to answer that question sometimes. So in, so one, one of the other things that I, I learned in my incident response class was that it's, I think it's too early in the incident to actually start placing blame or to doing things like root cause. Right. I mean, um, that, that should be done in the lessons learned right now. There's just a problem. So, you know, instead of trying to point fingers and, you know, maybe the person that caused the issue in the, in the, you know, at the end is also going to help fix the issue because, you know, they, um, you know, they're the only ones who can do that. And if you start blaming them, then they're going to be like, I, I'm just not going to help out with this. I'm out, you know, or, or something like that. Um, it, I mean, it's good to chronicle that stuff for the, the communications later on in the lessons learned. Um, but I mean, is there a way to not blame Joe, the intern for the bad password, or, um, is there, you know, how, how can you, how can you give a root cause during the engagement or the incident without necessarily giving a, a root cause? Cause I mean, even the solar winds folks didn't know how they got into the system, I would imagine until much, much later until, you know, hours or even days after. So, um, what, how do, how do how do you how do you push that off and go okay look we're not you know we're not placing blame right now we're not trying to figure out the root cause we're just trying to shore up the defenses and use our controls to you know mitigate or 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 remove the the risk so i think that the best thing to do is to make sure that the focus is placed in the right area if that makes sense yeah. um in other words, if somebody starts at, you know, how does this happen? How did this happen? Um, I would point out the fact that do they really want to know how it happened right now? Or would they rather let us prevent this from being worse? Let's, you know, I, I promise we will get as far to that answer as we can. Um, we're not going to know that for a while. So, you know, let's, let's manage what we can manage right now. And I think mm -hmm. it's about setting expectation, I guess, is, is kind of the point. Right. Um, and that's, that's tricky. But I, I think that that's key is that if you don't set that expectation, then um, ultimately, yeah, you're going to have a bunch of management that expects to know exactly what happened and who did it and what happened. And, uh, and, and that's not realistic up front. And, and by the way, I would say the whole business with the intern, that's an, that's a fabulous example of really, really bad communication right like yeah. blaming your intern like seriously yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and um you you got to be careful because what if you're wrong what if it wasn't the intern and you just told management and then management you know maybe they were confronted and under pressure and stressed out and they mentioned that the intern did it and you were wrong yeah. so how's that going to look Management told Congress, I believe that that so that's that's yeah. another whole next level of like you know, not not really knowing those things, but um, yeah, yeah, attribution it, is really hard. I mean, it's it's not an easy thing. I mean, occasionally you get lucky, right, and it's a slam dunk, but frequently right. it's a really really difficult thing, and it's one of the last things that you wind up doing. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, we've talked a little bit about. Uh, uh, the the discussion, you know, during the 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 issue, um, how how important is documentation? Because documentation and communication are going to go hand in hand here. You know, we have to draft the press releases, we have to you know massage that messaging. But once the engagement or once the incident has been called and there's no longer an incident, ideally you're supposed to be doing a lessons learned or root cause analysis or something like that. Um, what are, what are some of the things that you should be documenting to be able to communicate better in, on the back end? Everything. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds kind of crazy, right? Um, I take notes as I go, uh, when I'm working, whether it's a small, I, I hate to call it, you know, sort of nothing incident, right. Where there's no real ramification, but we found it, find out there's a problem. I'm always jotting down notes. 
uh, about sort of the basics that I can always go back to. Um, and, you know, no matter how you do that, uh, you want to answer, it, it's, it's basic um, journalism 101, who, what, where, when, how, and why, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you want to essentially try to be able to answer those questions when you're done. So as you're taking notes about what you're finding, if you have a partial answer to any of those questions, jot it down. And I'm always sort of thinking ahead about that. I mean, you could, I don't do this, but you could make a template, I suppose, and you could, you know, fill in the boxes as you go, whatever mechanism works for you. But, but I definitely take notes because at a minimum, I'm going to be writing a report and I'm going to mm -hmm. say, here's what I saw. And, um, and I'm, I may or may not make some claims based on what I saw. Cause in some friends cases, literally all I'm doing is saying, I examined the system and here is what I saw end of subject. Um, in, in something like, you know, a, an incident response like the exchange thing um, or, you know, we find out that, uh, that there's been um, some sort of fraud that's happened. Uh, I have to translate what I've seen in a technical way to non-technical audience. Hmm. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to answer who, what, where, when, how, and why. That's, that's really what the goal is because some portion of what I saw or what I did has to answer those questions. And right. each person in, as a part of that incident should do the same. Cause you, I can Agreed. envision multiple levels like um, the situation manager told this person to do X. And then this person said, okay, in order to accomplish X, I need to do A, B, and C. And that yes. might involve one or two other people. So those reports, screenshots, what you did, um, your evaluation, your conclusions all boil up to maybe, maybe even an executive filing an incident report, getting all these different reports at these different levels. You know, yeah, it'll be less detailed as it goes up. But finally, um, you know, somebody has to supply an incident report to either the press or to upper management or the board, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I would also add that, you know, I mean, so all of my reports start with how I was consulted. How, how did I get involved in this in the first place, right? Because like you were just saying, that sort of feeds back to the, to the next level beyond that. So you know, we received an email from this department asking us to look into X, Y, Z, or I was made aware of this by my supervisor, so-and-so, and this is what I did, right? I was asked to do the following. And so that leads you back to the supervisor. And ideally this, this supervisor, whoever did something, and maybe they talked they went to three or four different people and each of those have those reports. And like you said, it sort of can funnel all back together into one big story. Right. And that's, that's important no matter what level you're at. I mean, you may not be aware of the overall large incident, but um, your colleague told you, Oh, go check out this firewall and look at the logs and see if you see anything from uh, this particular domain. Right. Right. And, and you have no idea why, but still do a, a report as to what you found, boil that back up, and that may help in the overall you know, incident. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so Kathy, you, you'd mentioned taking notes. Um, <clears throat> uh, is it, it's important for communications, and I, I didn't want to go backwards, but I'm going to have to go backwards because, you know, we talked about status pages. We talked about methods of communication um, uh, earlier. Uh, is it, is it, would it make sense to say, okay, look, uh, you know, we're going to give you hourly briefings or, you know, this status page will update every 45 minutes with, you know, new information and, and hold people to that. Or um, I mean, should, should every incident be treated the same way in that respect? Or can you go on and, and say, okay, well, this is only like a, a level one incident versus, you know, something that's, you know, oh my God level. Um, it, 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 do you treat communication differently depending on how you initially, you know, think about how the incident is? Oh, this is not a huge deal. We just didn't provision somebody off or there's an insider threat or whatever. Um, do, do you ever, you know, do you ever, you know, 
scale your communication or your, your, your process there to what you believe that to be, or is everything the same? I would say it's definitely context driven. So, um, you know, not even incidents that I deal with specifically, but we might have an issue where a service is unavailable and our teams are required to put out a status update periodically that, and it, and it typically says there will be an update if there's been a change by this time, but the time window and all the details kind of vary based on the particulars, right? So let's say it's an outage because our, our ISP is down. Well, we can't give an update more often than we get it ourselves, right? Mm. Um, so if you're dealing with a third party, you may be limited as to how often you can update because you just don't have that information. So I think it's going to be context. It's, it's really going to be context driven. Uh, if it's something smaller, it's a, if it's not impacting a large piece of your organization, you may not need to do updates or communicate as much. Um, you know, And if it's not something where people are going to be getting phone calls from the newspaper, <laughs> that makes a big difference. Then, right. you know, suddenly your employees are getting phone calls and they're getting questions and uh, where you need to kind of get ahead of it. Right. Yeah. I guess that, I guess that makes sense. Cause um, and you know, you, you just mentioned here, what happens if, you know, uh, I, we just saw, we just, I just saw an interesting uh, tweet, uh, you know, list from uh, Tinkersec. He was, you know, do an in-map on the internet and found some, you know, cameras on somebody's, you know, network. And, you know, there's 20 or 30 different uh, posts of him going through this thing. And he's like, oh crap, I found this stuff. Somebody needs to be notified. If that was the company, now that that's been splattered all over Twitter, uh, you know, names weren't, names weren't mentioned, but just the, 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 the camera type. Um, how important is it to tell employees, you know, should you have a, communication policy or procedures like, okay, we're in the middle of an incident. So if, you know, and it's been leaked to the press, so, you know, Hey, help desk person, you know, refer them to somebody, you know, not the incident commander, but maybe your, your communications team or social media. Um, when, when would you put those things out? Or is that just something that uh, an organization should know about and, and, you know, and, and know how to do? Is that something you should put in the annual training that you put out or, you know, how would that work for your org? Well, I think um, <laughs> specifically for us, it, again, it's going to be context driven, right? So if it's, if it's something that is um, becoming widespread, we're often asked, is there a problem? Do we know something's going on? Is there an issue? And, uh, and communications will get involved if it's the kind of thing where we need to make a more formal announcement. Um, certainly because I work for a state university, which is sort of a whole other universe unto itself, it's kind of like a small city, um, that, that makes a lot of this challenging. So people who are brought on understand their state employees, even the students who are brought on as student employees. So you can't make a statement for a state organization unless you have the official power to make said statement. And you oh, can get into a lot of trouble if you do that. It, it works the same with vendors, right? Like we're not allowed to talk to salespeople directly because you know, that's not our job. We have people that talk to salespeople. We can say, we can reach out to an organization and say, you know, we would like information about this product, but we can't talk about money. We can't talk about anything like that. Okay. Very similar with communication. We have very restricted rules about what we're allowed to talk about. On the one hand, we're a public institution. So, you know, my information about who I am and what I do, generally speaking, is, is not a private thing. Uh, which is why it's fairly easy for me to, to give talks and kind of be all over the place. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm expected that I'm not going to talk about the details of what's going on in the, you know, in the organization at large, right? That's not mm -hmm. something I'm at liberty to do. So, right. so I don't, it's been a very long time since I've been hired and things have changed substantially. But I do know that even with our students, you do sign stuff that says you're a state employee and you're, you, there are expectations about what you do and don't do. And communication certainly falls under that. Oh, that's good to know. I did. I didn't know that. I didn't know that uh, you had to, you know, 
do, do you have to go through a class or something to be a representative of the university or no you basically sign your life away that just said you know you're just told during orientation at some point or at least 21 years ago plus when I was hired that's how they did it and I know our students have to sign that because I've seen the document that they have to sign um, but there is there is this expectation that you know as a state employee uh, you cannot speak for the organization without proper authority um, and like I said it's the same for you can't speak you can't buy you can't order you can't there are, there are these strict rules and you are you are explicitly told all of that at the very beginning. Right. Right. Okay. Mr. Betcher, how about yourself? Uh, you, you work in very much a corporate environment, but you work in a specific industry that's, you know, kind of, kind of cagey and, and, you know, prone to, you know, having some incidents once in a while. What, what, a, what is a communications policy like for y'all? Um, well, for, at my level, you, you just don't do it. Right. As oh, far as outside level. the organization, Ooh. right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. At that lower level, right? At that low of a level, you, you okay. just don't do it. And so, uh, yeah, I, I've never had to worry about it. Yeah. I mean, I would say I haven't either um, because I've just, even without signing your life away in the beginning, you just, especially when you move into security, right? You know, like your role is going to involve things that other people are not allowed to know about and right. you're not supposed to communicate. Um, and, and really our university, uh, probably more than a lot of others, um, has, has really pretty rigid guidelines about that, whether they're spoken or unspoken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Understood. Even, even uh, to your colleagues, you can't say things. You right. Know, like, Absolutely. Oh, what happened? Oh, Joe got ransomware. Right. You know, you can't say that at all. Oh, right. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, wow. Yeah. Having, having um, parts I, of your entire company that you wouldn't be able to tell people, tell things about, okay, yeah, there's an incident. We know that it's happening, but you can't tell X group uh, because... I mean, that, that would be very complicated, um, I would imagine. Yeah, that, that communication has to come from above, like an official email to employees or whatnot. Right. Yeah, you, and, and matter of fact, um, many years ago, we actually had a designated room where if we did have a situation, we would go to that room so we would be separated from all the other employees so they couldn't walk by and see our notes on the wall or whatever or hear us talking about IP addresses or uh, certain huh. other employees. So when there was an incident, we, we basically had a conference room and we had it reserved for that purpose and, and everybody else would be kicked out, right? So, okay. and, and then we would have the proper network access and all that stuff. So there was a plan whenever there was an incident, we'd go to that room so that things couldn't leak out inadvertently. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, Kathy, did you, do you have something similar to that at, 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 at uni there? Or, um, well, uh, I mean, obviously really. things have gotten weirder with zoom and whatever, you know, using virtual yeah. stuff, but. So, um, so a couple of things, we, the, the security office has its own space um, and we have our own conference room. And so frequently those conversations, uh, if they need to take place, will take place in our conference room sort of separate from, you know, the rest of the, the folks who are doing the other things. Um, but I also, at one point I worked for a government contractor and we literally had a room that uh, was, meant for those kinds of conversations because conversations that involve clearance and secret clearance of which I did not have, but uh, the same kinds of conversations that went on in that room, we also used for any kind of incident management because it was, uh, it, it was completely soundproof and the network was completely independent of the rest of the space. And, um, you know, so I've, I've kind of done both, but certainly we, we don't have those conversations in places where other people could just walk in and, and listen. 
Yeah. I, I guess it makes sense to have those rooms or to, you know, not notify the entire company there's an issue or to keep everybody in the loop because, um, you know, you may have somebody who would leak something that's a half truth or something not, you know, evidence as, as a fact and, and further muddy the waters, you know, we've seen it on Twitter where, or, you know, on, on social media where somebody was like, Oh yeah, I heard it was this. And it's like, you had to have somebody come back and refute and say, no, actually it wasn't that, but by then the damage is done. And now you have conflicting issues there, um, which could cause, you know, further legal issues. So I guess it's, uh, from a, um, from a, 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 a a legal point of view, the need to know is, is a, is a necessary, is a necessary uh, deal. So yeah, I can, absolutely. I can that. Okay. Um, let me see any other, any other discussions here? Uh, was, uh, I did, I did want to ask about in higher ed, are you beholden to different disclosure requirements than businesses? I guess part of that would be, I think we talked a little bit about that, but I mean, is there, do you have any kind of compliance requirement to disclose, you know, I obviously like breach notifications, I would imagine, but um, do you have different things that you're beholden to for that? So not really. Um, we, I mean, with FERPA, which is the regula regulatory piece that governs student data, um, you know, there's definitely supposed to be notification um, about that, but it's not it's not like credit cards or social security numbers. And really social security numbers are the big issue, right? And most right. of the regulatory stuff is governed by the state of New York. So we don't have anything special in higher ed in terms of, of legal requirements that other orgs don't, but we certainly have a focus um, on things like social security numbers, passports, driver's licenses, because that's the data we need to be able to, you know, hire people like other orgs, bring students in uh, on campus. We, we transitioned many years ago now, uh, but, you know, social security numbers were used for everything. You register for a course, you use your social, you know, and, and grades were posted by social security number. I mean, that was just the way it was done, right? They were, right. They, they were out public. And when that changed, um, that required everybody get some sort of special ID. And, you know, I mean, there was, there was even a time. So I mentioned, you know, my father was in computing. Well, he, he ran the computing center at the college in the town where I grew up for 41 years. And my, you know, one of my very early usernames that I had on his mainframe had part of my social security number in it. I mean, that was, again, it was, it was, oh, wow. it was the identifier. So a lot of that has changed. Um, and so, and, and it's changed in part because of the regulations that are kind of everywhere else. So I don't know that we have anything special. It's just that, you know, with, we have for regulation, which you wouldn't see in places that don't have students, because that is specific to students, um, you know, but otherwise all the regulations are the state and uh, federal the same things. Are you beholden to inter international standards? I mean, you must have international students potentially coming in. I mean, do you, do you have to, you know, do GDPR or anything like that for them? So yes and no. Um, legal, so, so we're part of a larger, our individual universities are part of the larger State University of New York system. And the State University of New York legal counsel has come out and said, here are the things you do with regard to GDPR. Um, and they're very specific. So I would say, yes, we, we absolutely, you know, are beholden to international laws, but the data we hold typically is more business centric and mm. less personal data for the sake of holding personal data, which is really what the GDPR rules are about. We don't hold data, or at least we try not to hold data we don't need. That's, that's you know, what most organizations should be doing. Right. Um, but we, yeah, it's, we have very specific guidelines about what we have to do with regard to GDPR and, and other things. Certainly, we have students from California, even right in this country, right? right? So, right. so you have other states. New York State has its own laws, California. And, and we're beholden to any law that is applicable, I think, is the best uh, the best way I can state it. it they're just different depending on um, the kind of data we're holding and why we're holding it. 
That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Betcher, do you have any other questions uh, for, for Kathy? I don't think so. Okay. Um, cool. So, uh, Kathy, if people wanted to talk to you about incident response, uh, you know, items or communication in particular, uh, how would they, how would they find you? Lots of ways to find me. Um, I'm investigator Chi, C H I, <laughs> on uh, Twitter, uh, only because investigator Chick, which is my normal handle, um, which is investigator C H I C, was one letter too long. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on I'm on Twitter. Um, you can find me under uh, my full name uh, on LinkedIn. I'm 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 out there. Uh, I'm involved with lots of conferences. Um, so, you know, my information's out there. I'm pretty easy to, to track down. Right. Um, yeah, before we, before we got started, this, this show part one, at least, uh, is going to come out, uh, or came out the weekend of B-Sides Rochester, New York, which, uh, uh, Kathy's one of the, the organizers of, uh, and, uh, today, the 7th of March, uh, you know, we were talking about Circle City Con, I think earlier in the week and, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'd just like to say congratulations. You're going to be speaking there um, on, on this topic. There's going to be some additional examples and stuff, uh, but I'm, uh, if uh, anybody is interested, uh, definitely go grab a ticket for Circle City Con so that you can uh, listen to Kathy talk about uh, incident response uh, uh, items and communication. Uh, is you said besides Rochester before we started recording, besides Rochester uh, did go on. Uh, I hope it did go on, but um, <laughs> Uh, what kind of, what kind of talks are, do you have been given there or are being given there? I hate this, this verb thing. <laughs> so uh, besides we're a, we're a very student focused conference, um, which means that we try to get very diverse topics because our students, we need them to be exposed to lots of different kinds of things. So, you know, we'll accept lots of, variety, I think is the best way, you know, I can, can say it. So whether it's um, entry level talks about, you know, here's my experience, uh, you know, becoming a red teamer for the first time. Um, we have students that participate in CCDC and CPTC. And if you're not familiar with those, those are the collegiate pen test and the uh, collegiate uh, defense competitions, cyber defense competitions. Um, and so there's, there are folks who are both defending and uh, doing offensive security. And so there's, there's a wide swath of interest. So we really try to get, you know, everything. Um, this, this year we've had uh, talks about OSINT. Uh, we had training about OSINT. We had training about Splunk and doing investigations with Splunk. Um, you know, so really the gamut, we, we try to get a little bit of everything when we can. Awesome. Okay, excellent. Uh, so yeah, I um, hope everybody enjoyed Besides Rochester. Uh, if you didn't get to check that out, mark it down in your calendar. Is it the same time every year? It's usually in March. Um, okay. And uh, ideally 2022, we're going to be back in person at the RIT Inn. That is our, our uh, it, we were supposed to have our, our big 10th anniversary in 2019. And of course, um, I'm sorry, in 2020, but of course in 2020, we had no conference because of right. <laughs> COVID. So we're gonna, mm. you know, we're, we're, we had this virtual event, we called it B-Sides Virtual Edition, but we're really gonna try for our 10th anniversary in 2022. Um, it should be in March. I don't have hard dates yet because some of it will depend on the, uh, the hotel slash inn and RIT. Because of our relationship with RIT, we try to schedule it at a time when the students aren't, um, you know, in the throes of exams or busy with open house or whatever. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, these, the, the early time of year here, uh, you know, is, is killing folks. Uh, even, even, even in June and July, I saw besides Las Vegas is, uh, is going fully virtual again this year. So, um, there's going to be much opportunity to gain to gain access to to B sides Las Vegas virtually, but yeah, there's a ton of ton of conferences are still you know at least the ones that later in the year you know in October November December timeframe are still trying to figure out whether or not they're going to try to do an in person thing or if they're going to try to go virtual. So um, I'm sure those will all shake out, including our own InfoSec campout. I think we talked about this. It's uh, we will have a virtual component, but we're we're going to try maybe a limited 
uh, deal at the end of August. Uh, if we can, if we can do it, um, we'll have more information as well um, about ours. So um, you can follow um, on Twitter, InfoSec Campout, all one word. And uh, but yeah, so uh, uh, Catherine, thank you for for coming on the show. Uh, appreciate it. I don't think we have enough incident response talks. Uh, on the show, I, I and I know Miss Berlin, and Mr. Betcher, they they love themselves some some blue team and some IR and some digital forensics discussions. And um, I, you know, if you ever want to come back on again to talk about something other than communications, we'd love to have you because you know incident response is, um, you know, people are like oh it's just incidents and stuff, but there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of um, a lot of need to understand those things because you know I I've I've worked maybe a handful of them in about 20 years, but every time I do it, it's like new every time I do it. And um, if you're not used to doing them, you, you learn something every time, but then you get out of practice. So it's good to, to, you know, at least have people who are, you know, having to do them, talk about it and, and be able to share their experiences. So I appreciate that. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I absolutely would be delighted to come back and, and talk about uh, some other things in the IR space or, or you know, or forensics. I'm, I'm working on another talk. Uh, I'm trying to come up with some entry level ideas um, or what I guess I would call more foundational ideas because we have folks that get into this space early on as maybe a SOC analyst mm. and um, or even just they're in a space where uh, they are maybe they're a sysadmin or they're doing help desk and they want to make the transition and you know I get asked all the time you know what do you what do I need to know to make that transition to blue team um, right. and and my answer is well it depends and of course everybody hates that answer but realistically it, it, it's going to depend on the environment you go into and how big it is right do you right. do you need to know all the different levels do you need to know pieces of it but there are some foundational skills that I think that are very helpful in making that transition so I'm, I'm going to try awesome. to put some talks together that cover some of those foundational skills um, where if you're working in in that other sector uh, if, if you're trying to make that jump, it's not just about certifications. It's not just about getting, you know, your feet wet in a different job. It's, you know, how can you do these things in the job you have to learn more about that space? Right. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I would, I would love to have that show come on <laughs> when, when you're ready to, to, you know, do that show, I uh, don't hesitate to reach out because um, you know, we talk about breaking in and being pen testers all the time and everybody's like, oh, it's so sexy to be pen tester and whatever. It's not. People who say that are not actually pen testers, I think. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> you get, you know, cracking shells in a, you know, in an environment all the time, every day is not fun. And, you know, incident response is, is, you know, well, I, I wouldn't say it's fun, but you know, it's, it's, it's challenging and it's, it, you know, it, uh, understanding how to be one, how to be one good, uh, very well is, is, is important. So yeah, when you're ready to give that talk, reach out please. Cause I'd love to have yeah, you back. By all means. And, and, you know, I mean, I have friends on, on both sides of the fence and, and I think, I think it's important to understand both sides. I actually wound up in this community because I wanted to understand more about pen testing and red teaming and what attackers do, mm. because I can't be a good defender without understanding those things. Yep. But I had to have foundational knowledge to even get as far as I did. So I think it's, right. I think it's all really important. Um, and I think it definitely takes a certain mindset to be oh, yeah. in, you know, the defense space because it's, <laughs> it's constant. Some days you don't feel like you're ever going to get a win, even when you do. Um, and, you know, getting into it, whether it's red or blue, just for the sexy nature of it, I think doesn't make you a long-term possibility, right? It's, you're yeah. going to burn out fast. Um, yep. But if you really enjoy learning and growing and I mean, that's, that's how, you know, you asked me at the very beginning, right? How did I wind up here? Well, at the end of the day, it was because I wanted to understand more. I wanted to understand the bigger picture. And the only way you do that is to keep learning. Very nice. Very nice. Cool. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And uh, very nice. So, yeah. Um, uh, so to, to, so we can end the show, Mr. Betcher, you, uh, you have an, uh, a forensic 
tool or a logging tool that you uh, are working on? Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, LogMD? Yeah, an incident response tool. Yeah. That it, um, its primary function is to get you started on logging in a Windows environment. And, you know, where do you start? What do you start logging, right? And so that helps you along the way be able to log the right things in a Windows environment. And uh, then it just uh, goes on from there, however you want to use it. You can mm -hmm. get into registry. You can get into, um, let's see, what else does it have? Um, memory. Um, let's see, uh, processes, all kinds of things, right? But it, but it primarily starts with the logging. And, and if you don't know how to start, it's a good start. It's a good place. Nice. And how would people find that if they were looking for that? The website is log-md.com. Cool. Okay. And uh, our, our mutual friend, uh, Michael Goff, he's speaking somewhere in the near future, isn't he? I can imagine he would be. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he does a lot of blue team and, and discussion on logging and stuff. Uh, I, I want to say I saw a tweet or something where he was going to be speaking in like Tulsa or something like that, but I could be wrong. So um, just keep an eye out if uh, you see him, uh, you know, speaking at a conference, know that uh, you're going to get some good information there. So um, cool. All right. Ms. Berlin, uh, she's, she's doing a lot. She, uh, she's got her detect and defense uh, tabletop uh uh, you know, incident response tabletop uh, system that she's doing with uh, uh, with her friend there. I think it's, I want to say Jeremy, it could be wrong. Shoot me, Ms. Berlin, if I'm wrong. Uh, you can find out about uh, all of her workshops and everything. You can follow her on uh, Twitter at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. Uh, she also does um, uh, Mental Health Hackers, which is uh, trying to bring awareness to InfoSec space and security and IT space about mental health issues. Uh, they are, they're doing some uh, regular uh, discussions. They have a Slack, I believe, for, uh, you know, discussion. If you want to go on there, uh, you know, reach out to her and, and, and you can get that information. And um, yeah, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R on Twitter and you can find her there. And um, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Brian Brake, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. And the podcast is uh, BrakeSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C on Twitter. Uh, we have a, a Slack, which is very active. We have a, uh, we actually have a, an incident response and digital forensics channel, uh, in, in addition to our blue team channel where, you know, we post things like, you know, tools that help, uh, you know, uh, an incident responses or gathering uh, analytics. Actually, I think I found one today that was, um, uh, you could analyze your Kubernetes environment, uh, to set up things like better logging or, or what have you. So, um, posted some links in the, in that channel for that. Uh, you can, uh, we're, we're invite only, but we don't, uh, we don't stop anybody from coming in unless they're a bot. You can email uh, bds.podcast.gmail.com uh, or send us a, a DM on Twitter uh, to break a second. We'll, we'll get on there. So uh, we have a Patreon. We'd like to thank all of our patron sponsors for their uh, support to the show. The podcast is always free, but um, you know, their, their monetary support helps for hosting fees, Zoom, uh, you know, time and effort of just, you know, building and, and maintaining community and getting the podcast out on a regular basis. I'd like to thank uh, Jeff T. He became a sponsor uh, on March 7th. Uh, he uh, is uh, doing what he can to help support the podcast and we appreciate his help uh, doing so. Um, let me see. Uh, T-Pub store. If you want to get a t-shirt, some masks, uh, you know, help out small business uh, or what have you, you can go to breaksec.com forward slash store. Uh, you know, you can get, uh, you know, some vintage stuff from our InfoSec Campout 2019 shop. Um, you know, everything's really good quality. The t-shirts, uh, they have uh, unisex and, and female uh, cut t-shirts, um, you know, coffee cups. The, the masks are really nice too. I actually sent some of those out to uh, uh, some friends of ours on the show and, uh, and yeah, they, they really enjoyed them. So you can go and, and check that out. We actually get a little kickback uh, to the show if you buy some stuff there. And you're also helping out small business uh, who, may, who may need that, uh, that business, especially in the, in the times of pandemic. So... 
Uh, I think that's everything. So uh, yeah, uh, Catherine, thank you for coming. Uh, we, you know, very, very much enjoy hearing uh, leaders talk about uh, incident response and important things that, uh, you know, uh, don't hear a lot about on, uh, on other podcasts. So uh, it's good to, to have you join us. Again, my, my pleasure. I'm really, uh, I really enjoyed it and I look forward to doing it again in the future. Right on. All right. Well, that was it for Breaking Down Security this week. Have a great week. Uh, be kind to one another. Uh, if the temperature gets above 50 degrees Fahrenheit or you know 10 degrees Celsius, get outside. Try to uh, you know get out, take a walk. Uh, you know, winter is hopefully done uh, for you, and uh, you know get out and, and get a little sun. So uh, take care of yourselves uh, because you're the only you you have, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye.